together. Good morning, everybody. What a great day to be here. It's a, a wonderful day to celebrate our Lord and Savior, to give him praise for everything that he's done for us. Um, I, I know I, you can't see me because I'm actually really short and I'm sitting behind this piano. <laughs> Um, but um, Pastor Terry, it's great to, to, to serve you today. I, I had off last week, um, and um, Pastor uh, Corbett did a great job and shared a great message of our Lord. Um, it's great to be refreshed and back and to serve and, and to rejoice. Just a couple of announcements. Coming up at the very end of the month, it's called Fifth Sunday. <laughs> it's the fifth Sunday of January, and we're going to be doing what we call Fifth Sunday Brunch. So on the fifth Sunday uh, of any time in the year, of any month, and the fifth Sunday, we're going to celebrate a time together. And so fifth Sunday brunch is we're going to have a, a service at 9.30, one service at 9.30, and then we are going to come together and, and come a, a, as a church, come as a fellowship and community, and, and have a meal together. So the, this first fifth Sunday is going to be pancakes. It's, it's, it's easy, it's quick, we can do a lot of them, and we encourage you to be part of that. If you would like to help in any way in, in with Fifth Sunday Brunch, there's a sign-up sheet out on the table in the narthex. Please sign up. And if you would like to do something like a, a side dish, some fruit, so, something else, it is brunch. And so there's other things that can come. If, you, if you, there's other foods that you really love for brunch, bring it. We, we'd love to have it. Next week, we'll have a sign-up sheet out there just to kind of get an idea of how many people we are expecting, just so that we can make sure we have enough tables and chairs and, and silverware and all that stuff um, for, for that day. But so it is coming up. Fifth Sunday brunch is at the end of the month. We'll keep reminding you one service and then uh, brunch following. The other thing is, is, is we are starting a new sermon series. It is titled The Strategic Plan. And today we're going to be diving into my mandate. 
and, and, and the mandate that we have been given by our God out of Romans chapter 12 where, where Paul just kind of brings it all together, brings the book of Romans in, in together with, with really what our church should be doing and how our church should be acting. So we'll be diving into this. This, this week is uh, our mandate. Next week, we will we continue with the, the, the sermon series, and, and we'll be actually going all the way to the fifth Sunday. We have some great things happening as we go through this sermon series. Today, we will be commissioning our, our church council, those that have been newly elected and those that are continue, will be continuing in serving. Next week, we have a great privilege of welcoming new members into our church. And how awesome is that, that God is bringing us together, growing our community, building us in fellowship. And then we'll have a week where our children's choir will be singing. And, and that, that's amazing, too. Our children's choir will be leading us in, in song and worship and, and, and sharing their gifts. And then we have Fifth Sunday Brunch. So it, it's, it's a lot of stuff happening this month. But God is definitely blessing us and, and giving us the, this great opportunity to come together. So a, as we begin this worship service, we, we've already sang holy, holy, holy. We've rejoiced in his name. We, we've celebrated who he is and, and that he is a God. He's God in three persons and, and we celebrate our trinity. And so let us come together and let us join our hearts in worship. I invite you, if you would, please stand. We make our beginning this morning like we do each and every day in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We were buried, therefore, with Christ by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. This is my beloved Son. I've forgotten the words that you have spoken. Promises that burn within my heart have now grown dim. With a doubting heart, I follow the path of earthly wisdom. Forgive me for my unbelief. Renew the fire again. transgressions help me love you
have mercy, Lord, have mercy on me. Well, Isaiah wrote about God's gracious servant. It was a prophecy about Jesus who, although he was righteous, exchanged places with us in baptism and on to death. So let us take a moment, let us confess our failures to reflect his obedient servanthood in our daily living. The Father put his spirit upon his servant, and we confess, good Lord. Amen. Well, Paul wrote, do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. It is my joy today as a called and ordained servant of the word and by his authority to forgive you of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's confess our Christian faith, his words, who he is in our lives. Let's say together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Wherever I am, wherever. 
Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart to my world. Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart to my world. Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart to my world. Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart to my world. Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart to my world. Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart to my world. Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart to my world. Like a rushing river, let mercy flow through my heart. To my world, pour me out, pour me out, pour me out, wherever I am, wherever I Great is his steadfast love toward us. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, although he had nothing of which to repent, Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Grant us your Holy Spirit and faith to trust that your son was taking our place and that your pleasure in his obedience means eternal life for us and all who are baptized in his name through the same Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> From Romans chapter 12, we are a living sacrifice. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of him, himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think about with a sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned for as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, 
the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Well, how awesome is that that we, we understand that our church, the church, God's church, is made up of many people, different people, different gifts, different strengths. How amazing that from the youngest to the oldest, it's, that's the way God intended it to be. And so as we, we take a look at the gospel out of the gospel of Matthew, and it begins in, in chapter 3, beginning at the 13th verse, the father is going to proclaim Jesus, his son. His voice is going to be spoken, and people are going to hear, and people are going to understand who he was. In, in, in Advent, we talked about so many people wanting to, and thinking that their child, their boy, their firstborn was actually the Messiah. But the father makes it known who he is. And it goes, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and do you come, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to, be fulfill, to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And that is our gospel. Well, grace, mercy, peace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. There's an organization out there by the name of Barna, and Barna does a lot of research on churches, and, and they, they, it, it seems like every week, every month, they put out something new. But they recently put out a, a survey, and, and, and then they gave the results, and they said that many churches grow to about one-third of their God-intended size. One-third. And, and they don't just give us the fact and just leave us there. They, they actually tell us why and that, that they're, they're thinking this. is because many churches, they conform to the, the shape of their culture and the surroundings of their neighborhood. And, and so there are these invisible barriers. And when these invisible barriers take shape, when these invisible barriers lead, then spiritual growth is stymied and evangelistic outreach doesn't exist. It hampers growth. And so the churches stay at one-third of their God-given size. So Barney is saying, churches, we, we need to start taking a look at these invisible barriers. We, we need to get moving in a way that God is, is leading us. God would have us to move. And, and notice it is God's way, not our way. It is not my way. It's the way God is asking us to go. It is not your way. It, it needs to be the direction that God is leading. And so we're going to be diving into this series called The Strategic Plan. We're going to be taking a look at, at our mandate, but it intersects, this, this whole idea intersects with Paul's letter to the Romans. When, when we think of this mandate or our mandate, we think of the foundation, our foundation, the summons, the order, the command. God is actually giving us marching orders, marching orders for his church. And I know some of us, if, if we, we heard it read, we, we kind of wonder, well, how is this about our mandate? It starts out, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. Well, that doesn't sound like marching orders. But, but it has to start here. Take a look at this. It has to start here by the mercies of God. It's spirit-filled. It's the spirit view of God's mercy. When we think of a Christian definition of the word mercy, we think of God's compassionate action towards desperate people. God's compassion, compassion, and in other words, we know that God has a heart, but, but he doesn't just stand still, it's God's compassionate action. It's more because he does something, and what does he do? He does it towards who? He does it towards his desperate people. He does it towards you and me. He does it towards all of us. So we have a God who just doesn't stand still, a, a God who just isn't watching God is a God of mercy and mercy towards his people. It's compassionate action towards desperate people. 
And when we really want to describe God, if there's any word to describe God, we can use the word mercy. I don't know how many of you have ever read Romans, especially Romans 1 through 11. In Romans chapters 1 through 11, Paul is is building for chapter 12, verse 1. He is building it because he is building it by, by sharing with us mercy. So that we can understand, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God. In in Romans 3, he says, For all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. All have sinned and fallen short. Who? that's us. We are the desperate people. But then it goes on and, and tells us, but we are justified free by his grace as a gift and redemption is in Christ Jesus. And you know what we call that? You can say it. Mercy. Romans 4, who was delivered up for our trans- trespasses and raised for our justifications. Our trespasses. That's us. Desperate people. And he was delivered up and raised for our justification. And do you know what we can call that? You can say it. Mercy. Mercy. Throughout the first 11 chapters in Romans, we we see marvelous mercy and multiplied mercy and and miraculous mercy and mercy upon mercy. It's throughout all Romans, those first 11 chapters, building up to chapter 12. So that we can understand that we are not, we do not live a life that is defined by the records of our past. And we do not live a life that is defined by all our bad, bad decisions or, or defined by guilt and shame and emptiness and brokenness. You, your life, my life, we are defined by one word. And we can say that word. It's mercy. Mercy. If we just sit and we listen, we don't really do anything. But if we get a fresh view in our hearts and in our heads of this mercy, we can truly understand the kind of God that we have. God that loves us, God that walks with us. It's absolutely amazing how the world is trying to turn us around. It tells us that there, there are different means in, in, to the problems in our society. There, there are different reasons why we have problems in our lives. The, the world tells us that we aren't doing the right things or, or we believing in things in, in, not in the correct way, that we need to start focusing on world views, on political views, on cultural views. But the problem is that, that we need to understand we are stubborn fools and we are liars to ourselves. The problem is, is that we are at war with our creator. That is the major problem. But the answer, the answer, the solution comes right there in in verse 1, at the beginning of this verse, and that is all by one word, mercy. So in view of God's mercy, in view of God's mercy, we now can follow and understand what our mandate is. Because we have a great commitment and following that, it says, in, in the, by the mercies of God, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. To, to, to view this marvelous, multiplied mercy, we must make a great commitment. We need to offer our bodies, that means our hands, our, our feet, our eyes, our ears, our tongue, our heart, our intellect, everything, every part of you, we need to offer them as a living sacrifice. strange because every time I've read the Old Testament when they they don't talk about things as a living sacrifice they're dead they're dead the the ram the lamb the bull the pigeon they they kill them 
and they've sacrificed him. A, a living sacrifice is, is this contradiction of terms. It's a paradox. It, it makes no sense. Think about that. We, we have those here today in our, in our words, in our society, you know, words like jumbo shrimp. It's a paradox. It makes no sense. And I know I'm going to get an evil look here from the back row. Chicago Bears football makes no sense. Short sermons make no sense. It doesn't connect. It doesn't flow. It doesn't work. So, so we ask, well, what is this living sacrifice? Well, we know it, it's being alive to Jesus, but dead to ourselves. It, it's being involved to Jesus. It, it's, it's like being here today, showing up here today. But this great commitment does not mean we just sit still. This great commitment means that there's involvement. It means sacrifice. It means to give it everything. A complete commitment. In view of God's mercy, Paul is telling us to make a great commitment, not a half-hearted commitment, not a commitment when you feel like it, not a commitment when it's convenient, not a commitment when you feel the time is right, but to make a great commitment to what? To the great commandment. And we all know the great commandment. In Matthew 22, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We know that one. But Paul told us in Romans, for the, the commandments, you should not commit adultery, you should not murder, you should not steal, you should not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We should make a commitment to the great commandment by loving God, by loving our neighbor. To love God, to make this great commitment, it's not something abstract, it's concretely to people. Love them as God has loved them. Love them as we've been called to love. Love them as we have been commanded to love. In London, there's a place called Three Mills Green. And the story is, in, in this place, there was this man who was working on a well, and, and as he was working, he was, he was overcome by carbonic acid. And as he was struggling, and another person saw him, another worker saw him, and he went in to try to save him, and soon he was overcome by it also. And then another person, and then another person, and soon all the people that tried, they all died. And so they decided we're going to build this memorial dedicated to these men, these men who showed love. It wasn't the kind of love that says, I'll be there if you need me, but honestly, I'm never going to show up. But it's the love that, that is involved. The kind of love that lives for others, that kind of love that gives rather than gets. You can see it's two hands. Two hands connected, and that is the great commitment. Two hands connected. It's the great commitment to, to my neighbor in need. Bodies, bricks, budgets. Bodies, bricks, and budgets. Many churches measure success by those three words. Bodies, bricks, and budgets. And I know Crown of Life has. If you got the bodies and you got the bricks or the building and you got the budget, then you are successful. And there's nothing wrong with asking how many or, or asking about the, the building or, or how do you make the budget. Those things are important. But brothers and sisters in Christ, God is after more than just bodies, bricks, and budgets. The ultimate success of a church is how loving. How connected are, are we to one another? 
Paul is telling us in the view of God's mercy to offer yourselves as living sacrifices, to offer a great commitment to the great commandment, to be connected, to love one another. But Paul doesn't stop there because there's so much more. Paul is also telling us to make a great commitment, not only to the great commandment, but also to the great commission. And we know that, we memorize it, we can say it, we can recite it, go therefore, make disciples to all nations, and we can go on. But the problem is, is the great commission becomes a great omission. We all want to take care of 2975 Dutton Road, Rochester Hills, Michigan, don't we? We want to take care of those that are here at 2975 Dutton Road. Take care of those who have always been here. Take care of those who are, are considered members here. To many of us, 2975 Dutton Road, Rochester Hills, Michigan, is the greatest place in sliced bread. But what about outside of 2975 Dutton Road? What about the people in the neighborhoods that surround this church? We're your neighbors. What, what about the people in the senior facility across the street? There's more to Rochester Hills than 2975. What about all the rest of Rochester Hills or Rochester or, or Oakland County or Michigan or North America or around the world? You see, God has more than just 2975 Dutton Road. And, and Paul is, is teaching us that we need to think outside of, of itself, outside of 2975 Dutton Road. He wants us to be aligned with God's purposes, to follow what God asks of us. Because, see, God is telling us about this great commitment, a great commitment to a great commandment and the great commission. It's going to build a great church. In Romans 16, the, the, the church in Rome was a great church with great people who had a great commitment to a great commandment to the great commission. And in fact, it was being written about, talking about being connected to Christ. People were being called a great help. People were being thanked for risking their lives, for working very hard to test and approve in Christ, to be chosen in the Lord. That is connected. And that's what God's relationally charged mercy does. Connects us. October 15, 1981. You all know what happened that day, right? Yes? No. October 15, 1981. Game four of the American League Championship between the A's and the Yankees. It's the fifth inning and the A's were up and the Yankees looked like they were totally defeated. And the fans were starting to get really quiet. You know how the, the, the announcers say the fans are no, not in it anymore. The fans have been taken out of the game. That's what was going on. Until a gentleman by the name of George Henderson. George Henderson came to the game that day with a drum. On October 15, 1981, George Henderson beat on that drum and he led the people in the very first wave. He rallied the people. He encouraged the home team. As, as the people got excited, somebody called it in, the, in an article an expression collection of passion release. An expression, collection of passion released. God is calling for waves at crown of life. 
God is calling us not to just sit there, but to be an expression, collection of passion, release. The status quo isn't enough anymore. We need to have waves of gospel revelation. We need to mark it by changed lives and the sure presence of the Holy Spirit, not only in this place, but in every place, in every life. The wave begins with a drum, a drum to rally the crowd, a drum to rally you, to rally me, to rally this congregation. And we have that drum being beaten. It's being beaten and it was shared with us and it can be defined into one word and that word is mercy. God's compassionate action towards desperate. And our mandate tells us to make a great commitment to the great commandment and a great commission so God can build a great church and we can do it because God has poured out mercy upon us and we in turn can share that mercy with others. Because we've been empowered to. 2975 Dutton Road is a great place with great people, with a great mission, with a great desire and a great building. But are we following a great omission? Are we living out a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission? not just here at 2975, but throughout the world. So God's mercy can be known to all. Let the waves begin. Hear the drum. Let the waves begin. In his most precious name, amen. So we want to continue by doing our noisy offering. Um, the last time we did noisy offering, we had so much that we ran out of space, so we got a bigger can. <laughs> so if, if parents, I know there's not a whole lot of children here, but if children, if you want to come forward, kids want to come forward, parents, if you want to come forward, let's rejoice by giving just the might in glory of God. that he has given us, and we celebrate them by listening. Whoa. At this time, I'm going to ask the, the, the members of our church council, new and returning members, to come forward, please, if they would, right here.
But dear friends, you have been chosen and elected by the people here at Crown of Life for leadership at the church. This ministry is a blessing and a serious responsibility, and it recognizes your special gifts and calls you to work among us and for us. In love, we thank you for the acceptance of your obligation and the challenge you offer, because we know that you're going to give the best to the Lord, to his people, and to our ministry, both inside this building and outside in the surrounding community. We're going to live a life in Christ and make him known in your witness and your work. So today we commission new members, Fred Baines as Council Vice President and Allison Paisecki as Council Secretary. We also recognize and commission the returning members of our church council. Some of them were at the first service, Rick Hart as Council President, Dick Shore as Council Treasurer, Karen Hart as Financial Secretary, Lisa Sage in Outreach, Tim Worsing with Properties, and Brian Paisecki as Spiritual Care. And so today I ask you that are standing here, will you willingly serve the congregation crown of life faithfully? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. Will you devote yourself to the service of God, both for the good of this congregation, its facilities, the people who worship here, and the community that surrounds this place? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. Will you share Jesus to those around you in times of meeting and in times of fellowship? Will your words and actions not be of gossip and negativity, but your talk, emotions, and focus be positive and Christ-centered? So to enable this church to share the love and peace of our Heavenly Father, if so, answer, we will with the help of God. Will you be responsible to the task for which you have been chosen? Will you stay within your role and support others in their role in prayer and discussion? Will you help move Crown of Life forward in the direction where God is leading? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. But brothers and sisters in Christ, you've heard their commitment. And so dear fellow disciples here at Crown of Life, let us rejoice that God provides labors in the vineyard. Will you, though, also, will you do all that you can to assist and encourage them in the responsibilities to which they have been appointed and commissioned, giving them your cooperation, your counsel, and your prayers? If so, answer, we will with the help of God. We will with the help of God. Let us pray. Almighty God, pour out your blessings upon these, your servants, who have been given particular roles in your church. Grant them grace to give themselves wholeheartedly in your service. Keep before them the example of our Lord, who did not think first of himself, but gave himself for us all. Let them share in his ministry and love, that they may enter into his joy. Guide them in their work. Reward their faithfulness with the knowledge that through them your purposes are accomplished. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And so it is my joy to commission you to our church council, to serve him with your whole heart, your soul, and your mind, and to give the love of Jesus to everyone here and to each other. So it is my joy to give it to you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you turn around? Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's thank these, our new members of our church council, if you would, please. Thank you very much. I invite you to please stand. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this day lifting up our hearts, realizing that there is a great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission. Lord, help us to follow this, this mandate that you've set before us in your word so that your church will be great. Not only here at 2975 Dunn Road, but throughout Oakland County, throughout Rochester Hills, throughout Michigan, throughout the United States, throughout the world, that your name will be shared, your glory will be proclaimed, your love will be given. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everyone that serves you using their time, treasures, and talents. That they use it for your glory. We thank you for the gifts that have been given, for the people that are willing to work, for the, the, the council that is willing to serve. Lord, we pray for those people that are hurting in, in some way, those that are fighting uh, cancer, those that are fighting diseases. We ask for healing for Amy and Becca and Carl and Kathy and Kurt, for Marlene and Sue, for Deputy McDonald and Fred and Heinke and Susan and Terry and Gil. We ask that you be with Clarence as he has been 
diagnosed with possible bone cancer. As more tests are coming, Lord, be with him, be with his family as they wait and wonder. We pray for Tina, who is struggling through breast cancer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you, you, you work through the doctors and the nurses that, that they can resolve this illness so that she can return home to her family soon. And Heavenly Father, we lay before you Fulton, who has been suffering from pneumonia. But Lord, it, it, it's causing him to have to wait now longer for lung surgery. Heavenly Father, we, we pray for healing. We pray for that the pneumonia will be gone. And then, and then Lord, that the, the, the doctors, the nurses, the surgeons that will be working with him. Lord, give them a steady heart and hand so that they can help him and cure him of what is hurting him. Be with his family as they wait and wonder and worry. Lord, we thank you for being a God of compassion and love. And for Heavenly Father, we pray for the family of Craig, who was found unresponsive this last week. And Lord, the family is just, is just devastated. Lord, give them peace and comfort. Thank you for calling your servant Craig home, for, for telling him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Lord, for the gift, that the promise of being the resurrection and the life that we too also have earned that because of what you have done. All these things, Lord, we lay before you. And the things we might not have said, we know that you have heard as we pray that absolutely perfect prayer that you've taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What an amazing God that we have, that he gives us this great commitment so that we can live in him and he can live in us. And that he pours out his grace and mercy upon us and he feeds us each and every moment of our lives. And we get to come before him and receive this feast. And so on the night when he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So as often as we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And it's with assurance that we can say, Amen, come Lord Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So as we go through communion, we'll be coming up this side, up the center aisle. And, and this side, once you receive the bread here, you can go and, and receive the, the, the wine there. And there's this place to throw out the cup. If you do not desire, do, do, don't desire to receive communion, but would like to come forward and, and receive a, a blessing, please come forward. Just cross your arms and, and we will give you a blessing because you also have received this amazing gift of forgiveness that he has poured out for all people. And for the children, please bring them forward too, and we will give them a blessing also. So the table has been set. Come, let's feast. So take and eat that you body of the Lord and see that Jesus Christ is given for you. Take eat that you body of the Lord and see that Jesus Christ.
Take and eat what your body and your Lord has made. Take eat what your body and your Lord has made. Take and eat what your body and your Lord has made. Take eat what your body and what the Lord has made. Take and eat what your body and what the Lord has made. Take eat what your body and what the Lord has made. Take and eat what your body and what the Lord has made. Take eat what your body and what the Lord has made. Take and eat what your body and what the Lord has made. Take eat what your body and what the Lord has made. Drink with your blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please stand. And so now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ may it strengthen and preserve you from this day forth forevermore, knowing that we live in him and he lives in us. And together, knowing that and being fed by him, we have a great commitment to the great commandment, the great commission, so that we can build his church. But he never sends us alone. He sends us with him in his name. And so the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. So let's close with one more song as we celebrate who he is and, and what he has done for us and why we live. We, we know this one. Sing it out. Sing it for his glory. Wrestling and in my doubt, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let. Troubled sea. Here we go. 
my lighthouse, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Thanks be to God. Have a great week, everybody. Amen.